Good morning, church. It's good to see everybody this morning, and it's a wonderful morning to worship together. Uh, glad to, to have you with us, and you, you made it through the, the difficult traffic situation out there in Nebraska. I keep, I keep driving into it thinking it's going to be there, and it's not there. Uh, but uh, glad you could make it this morning. I trust you didn't have too much difficulty getting in uh, to the church. Uh, got a few announcements, several announcements before we get started. Uh, the first is this. Um, we would like uh, to get um, addresses for our military families. So if you have someone in your family who's in the military, please uh, send us their address so that we can put those things in the bulletin. We'll do that uh, probably every, every week. And so that way our church family has an easy way to send cards and, and even care packages uh, to our, our military men and women who are out in the field. So uh, we don't have those addresses right now. So if you could help us with that, please fill those out. You could put it on a prayer card, throw it in the uh, offering bag as it comes along, and, uh, or just call the office and let us know, and we'd uh, love to, uh, to get that from you. Uh, also, this next Sunday is going to be Mother's Day. And uh, Laura is working on a uh, video collage, uh, special music, and she'd like to include as many different mothers from our congregation as possible and or just your mother. So if you have pictures of yourself with your mother, yourself with your kids or grandkids, and you'd like to be included in that, uh, just email us. Uh, email me, uh, call, email the church, and, and get that to us. Try to do that as soon as possible. We want to try and finish that um, early in the week, uh, but we'd love to include as many um, of the, the women in our congregation as possible, so please add that for us. Uh, another thing, uh, also for kind of for Mother's Day, uh, we're going to continue to have bottles out there in the lobby as you leave to your left. Uh, we, we lost all of them last week. Uh, you, excellent job. Oh, we had people coming up after because we were out of bottles, so we have some more. Uh, and this is uh, for Change for Life. This will help support the Pregnancy Resource Center here in Dinuba and uh, continue to, to make sure that we are able to minister to those who are uh, in our community that are either struggling with whether or not to abort a child or have done so in the past and they need the hope of the gospel. So uh, if you take one of these bottles, you can fill it up uh, from next Sunday. It will be the last Sunday we have bottles out there. Uh, until Father's Day, you have time to, to fill this up uh, with either uh, coins or, or cash or checks, and then bring that back to the church on Father's Day, and then we'll make sure that those get to uh, the right place for you. So if you'd like to take one of those, you can do that on your way out this morning. We also ask that you just sign on there so we know how many are out there and who has taken what, and we could follow up about it. Uh, also, uh, announcement for this week. This coming Wednesday is Awana Awards Night. Uh, we have finished another uh, Awana year, and we're very glad to be able to do that back in person this last year. And uh, so this Wednesday, a reminder to our Awana families and a, a welcome to anybody in our church. You can all show up and be a part in our Awana Awards Night this coming Wednesday at 6 o'clock. That's a 6.15. That's our normal Awana Club night, but it's at 6 o'clock this coming Wednesday. There's also going to be dinner for a dollar at 5 o'clock, and uh, you're all welcome to participate in that as well. Uh, so it's going it's to be a wonderful celebration of kids who have been, uh, every Wednesday, they've been storing the, the word of the Lord in their heart, and uh, we want to celebrate them together. Uh, the last announcement I have for you is uh, also this coming week on Saturday is our Women's Spring High Tea. It's going to be this uh, Saturday from 2 to 4 here in our fellowship hall, right behind the wall there. And uh, you can bring family or friends uh, to this. It's, it's kind of a pre-Mother's Day event. Uh, my wife, Laura, will be speaking, and uh, Maddie Tuttle uh, will also be sharing uh, some special music at that. There's no cost to attend, and uh, they'd, they'd love for you to, uh, to come to that. So that, that's going to be a lot of fun, and that's this coming Saturday. Now, those are all the announcements I have for this morning. Uh, let's begin worship together. Let's do so with a call to worship from our Lord in Psalm chapter 3. We'll read selections of this psalm. O Lord, how many are my foes! 
Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no, no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord God, we do cry to you this morning. We come together, we gather to lift our voices as one to the God of all the earth, the God who is our salvation. And we know you will answer us. We know you will speak to us. And we ask you again to do so this morning. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, please stand as the worship team prepares to lead us, and please greet one another as they do so. Lord, most high. We will 
is an endless song that echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring, and though the storms may come, I am holding. standing for our scripture reading. Uh, We'll be in Acts chapter 21 this morning. We're going to begin by reading verses 1 through 6 together. You'll read the highlighted text, the word of the Lord. And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, who stayed there for seven days, and through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on into Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey, and they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. I 
have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. Well, for our second scripture reading, I've asked uh, one of our uh, deaconesses, one of our uh, new deaconesses, Maddie uh, Tuttle, if she would come and read for us. She's going to read in Acts chapter 21, uh, verses 7 through 14. Maddie. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemus. And we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. And we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am, not only, I, for I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. Amen. You may be seated. Would you now join me uh, together in prayer and uh, together with your church this morning? Father God, we were reminded in those last words that Maddie just read to, to pray the same, what the will of the Lord be done. We pray, Lord, uh, in the mystery uh, of knowing that you hear our prayers and you answer them. You make our own requests a part of your will, the, the will that you have set in place from eternity past, and that puzzles us, that amazes us, that astounds us with the privilege of prayer. So we say, let the will of the Lord be done. We also are reminded, Lord, and perhaps we don't do this enough, to just stop. To stand before you, to kneel before you in silence and in confession. Every one of us, Lord, we have sins to confess to you, to say, Lord, I know I am forgiven of these, but I confess them again and I say, Lord, I am Sorry, would you forgive me and help me to walk right with you? Before we go any further in the service, would we take a moment of silence for each of us to do that uh, right now?
Lord, would you now hear our prayers? We pray, first of all, for those serving along with us in ministry here in our church. We want to thank this week of our youth and children's ministry leaders who uh, volunteer their time, their dedication, their affection and love for our youth and, and our children. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, give them perseverance and joy in the ministry and use them, Lord, to mature uh, our youth in the faith. We pray for our missionaries, Lord. This week we think of Raymond and Peggy Stripling who serve um, at Lakeside Community Church and Raymond teaches at Bethlehem College in New Zealand, training up uh, missionaries and, and pastors to go out and serve. Uh, and Lord, we thank you for that ministry. We pray too for our own denomination churches and we think uh, this week of Pastor Jack Hugh uh, and his wife, uh, Amata, who serve at the Bay Area Christian Gospel Church in Oakland. Lord, would you bless them uh, in that uh, culture and environment, Lord, to uh, proclaim clearly the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, uh, when we pray, we also want to thank you. We don't just want to, Lord, ask for your requests, but we thank you for the ways you answer prayers. We want to stop and think on those things and ways you've done it specifically. This past week, we Think of Brenda Lincoln, who had a hospital stay uh, and an MRI done after uh, dizzy spells, and it turned out that, Lord, it was probably just high blood sugar, and, and you sent her home right away, and we thank you for that. We thank you for giving her an answer and pray that you would bless her as she deals with that moving forward. We thank you, too, for Rodney Stevens, who uh, just over a week ago, he also had a scare where he had a hospital stay and a, a really swollen uh, leg and that turned out to, to not be anything too serious and just needs more time and recovery. We thank you for that and pray for him to continue in that recovery. Uh, we also continue to pray for Rudy, the friend of Rachel Lira, who had a triple bypass surgery recently and uh, he, he was intubated for a time after that and now he is home. <laughs> Lord, it's been a long journey for him and we thank you for uh, healing him to this point. We pray the same uh, for the days that follow. Father, our hearts are also broken uh, by the loss of some people that we know, some that are a, a bit distant to us, but still we want to lift up their families. We think of the Morelli family. Pauline Morelli passed this last week. She was a longtime member of First Baptist Arosi, uh, which many of our church um, are also, have also been a part of, and we pray for the Morellis. We pray, too, for Joe Crow, who is a family friend of Tom Ogata, and he's been on hospice care now um, and seems close to passing. Uh, they continue to pray for his healing, but more so that Joe would know for certain the gospel of Jesus Christ and that, Lord, you would take him home. I had just learned this morning that uh, Wanda, um, Debbie Petnack's mother fell just last night. She has a fractured vertebrae. She's in the hospital. It uh, looks like it's just something that needs to heal on its own, but Lord, um, it's been a series of, of difficulties for Wanda, and we pray you would deliver her through this. We also heard this week an update on uh, Walter. He is uh, a uh, friend of a co-worker of Ivy Simmons, uh, or uncle of a co-worker, and uh, he was in a really bad motorcycle accident early in April, and now it looks like he's, he's not going to walk again. He is blind, and blind for the rest of his life. And despite that, he should be out of, the, out of the ICU finally this coming week. And Lord, we just pray for him that he would not, he would not be overcome by despair, but he would be humbled again to know the truth of the God who is his creator and his savior and who can give him a hope that endures whatever losses we have in this life. Lord, we, we also want to continue to pray for Sherry Bernard. She just started chemo and this last week um, had, had a pretty rough last couple of days, difficult symptoms, and Lord, we, we pray you would uh, give her give her the endurance of, of your spirit. And Lord, would you uh, minimize these symptoms she's going through and, and show her good progress 
as she goes through this chemotherapy treatment. Veronica McLaughlin wants us to, to lift up her father and mother. Her father, Joe, has just found um, masses on his liver. And he's got upcoming tests to see if they're cancerous. Veronica's mother, Beatrice, was diagnosed just recently with an autoimmune disorder that's affecting her liver, and she's needing an operation on the 3rd this coming week uh, for varicose veins that are the result of that. They're also needing to check her uh, esophagus for the same, which could be life-threatening, and our own Marilyn Roberts um, had the exact same thing happen to her, uh, almost bleeding out because of that. Please, Lord, heal Beatrice and Joe. And Lord, uh, make them so aware of your presence right now. Robin and Shauna, daughter and daughter-in-law of Chuck and Diana Gaither, just had surgeries recently, and we pray for their quick recovery. They also, more seriously, they lift up their granddaughter, Rachel, who is being attacked in her faith, and she needs to be strengthened. She needs, Lord, the answers of your word. She needs, Lord, to meet her Savior and to have the doubts and the lies of the enemy dispelled. Lord, we also want to lift up uh, Tim. He's the son of Richard and Peggy James. He's been diagnosed recently with a rare, untreatable disease, and he's seeking a UCLA specialist right now. Um, Lord, it, it does not look good. We pray that you would um, bless this family, Lord. G give them unity in the faith and closeness with each other and give them some answers, we pray. Finally, Lord, we, we want to lift up to Gary Gurner. He's a family friend of Pastor Nick and he's having a procedure this coming week related to uh, a recent diagnosis of bladder cancer. Lord, what, what a difficult thing to have to face, and it seems like so many of us are facing similar situations. And we pray, Lord, the best thing we can pray. Let the will of the Lord be done. We know, Lord, your will is better than ours ever could be. Your plan is greater than our plan ever could be. And your love and your care for us is greater than any other care we could hope for. So we surrender our requests to you, Lord, and we commit them to your will and your purpose. It is in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. At this time, uh, children can be dismissed uh, for our children's classes, if they would like. Otherwise, they're welcome to stay here with us. And we are going to continue worshiping and doing so right now in the giving of our tithes and offerings. To prepare us for that giving, I'd like to read a text of scripture from Matthew chapter 25. And this is what the, the Lord says to us, and I think it's a good instruction for our giving. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to, the, to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Let us now worship in the giving of our tithes and offerings to the Lord.
Thank you, Mary. Thank you, John. Lord, would you speak to us now by your word that we might know you are present with us and that we might know that we met the Lord this morning. We need your blessing, Lord, and we look forward for you to give it to us. Amen. Well, as we continue our series here in the book of Acts, the question that we are going to begin asking ourselves this morning is, uh, is it worth it? Is it worth my time? Is it worth my investment, my effort? This is a question that we really ask about every day uh, for a number of things. What to watch on TV? Uh, what to buy at the grocery store, what, what job to pursue, what, what person to marry, what significant commitment to make in my life. Is it worth my time? Uh, this is even a question that the Christian asks and asks about his witness for Christ, his witness to a specific person. How to witness? Is it worth my time. Well, this morning, we're going to see in Acts chapter 21 three truths about counting the cost. Uh, three truths that help us to have the right perspective about the costs of witnessing for Christ and obeying Christ in our time. Now, before we jump into uh, those uh, places, what, what we want to do first is to kind of look at a map here of uh, where we're at and what's going on. We, when we read Acts chapter 21, there's a, a lot of different places mentioned here, and uh, we're going to try and have some kind of bearing on where we're at. So here's a big map of the area we're in, and Paul's travels to this point, and the third missionary journey, and we're on the, the last part of it. We could zoom in a little bit here to kind of see where we're at, starting in the top left there at Miletus. Uh, he's traveling through uh, Kos and then Rhodes, and they, they come to Batara, and then they go all the way down uh, to that bottom right area of the map. That's where our time and attention is focused on in Acts chapter 21. So that's kind of where we're at right now. And as Paul is there in Tyre and Caesarea, uh, he comes to a, a couple different conclusions about counting the, cross, the cost. And the first that he does is this, that counting the cost is normal and right. Counting the cost is normal and and right. This question about counting the cost arises when, when Paul was staying here at Tyre, the first place he stays uh, along his route. And the church there was counting the cost for Paul. Uh, they do this when it says in verse 4 that through the Spirit they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Now, this raises an interesting question, and, and we need to understand it before moving on. Does this mean that the Holy Spirit was telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem? Well, the answer is no, and there's a few reasons why. The first is that this would be contradictory to what Paul has already said in Acts chapter 20 when he said that he was constrained by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. So the Spirit was telling him to go. And the later encounter with Agabus in verses 10 through 12 here, it spells out in more detail the same kind of encounter we can expect that Paul did have uh, at the beginning of this, this section when he was in Tyre. So note in verse 11 that the, the prophecy of the Holy Spirit is just a prediction. It's just predicting what's going to happen. And it's the people who respond to that prediction and then tell Paul, don't go. The prophet Agabus and the people of the church of Tyre were, were understanding a clear message by the Spirit about Paul's arrest, and, and then they came to their own conclusion about what Paul should do in light of it. Uh, they were understanding the same thing that the Spirit had al also told Paul back in Acts chapter 20, uh, when he said that he knew he was going to encounter persecution and imprisonment. So the Holy Spirit's not saying anything different, but why is the Holy Spirit repeating this message and, and doing so in such a strange way uh, through Agabus here. 
Now, it's kind of hard to imagine how this would have happened. And the first thing that, I, that comes to my mind is that this is kind of a bit hilarious. I mean, he takes his belt off, and I guess he laid on the ground and tied himself up like a hog and then starts preaching a prophecy to him. Or maybe he was bent all the way over and doing something like this. I, it's kind of a really weird, strange thing. But I think this isn't really, this isn't here to be humorous or, or, or anything like this. Uh, I think this is meant to be heartbreaking and emotional. You know, the, the prophet and, and the church here, they're doing their best to urge Paul not to go. And, and you could perhaps imagine Agabus in, in being a bit dramatic and, and emotional, uh, trying to get through to Paul. He, d- he just rips Paul's belt off. He ties himself up and he says, this is what is going to happen to you. Don't you get it? This display also is primarily for the church, it seems, and not for Paul. Paul already knew what was going to happen. Maybe the church knew that already or not. But what the Spirit seems to be trying to do, both for Paul and really for the church, is to make clear to everyone the cost of witnessing for Christ in Jerusalem. And this is the more clear emphasis that the passage seems to be teaching. The Spirit wants to make clear to Paul and the people the nature of what's going to happen so that they can count the cost. And I think there's two things we can learn about this uh, section of Scripture. First, that counting the cost is normal. It's normal. It's normal for yourself when you're about to undertake a significant cost to your life, a significant cost to to your ministry, a significant cost to your friend, to, to a family member, to a Christian brother or sister. It's normal to say, hey, wait a minute. Do you really understand what's about to happen? In fact, in this section, the people that are helping Paul count the cost include Luke, who wrote this letter. He says, we here. Paul's companions who were with him, also included in that we, it includes the church at Caesarea, it includes, it includes the church at Tyre, it includes the church at Ephesus, the elders there at Ephesus. They are all concerned for Paul. They don't want this to happen. Counting the cost, it's normal. But second, it is, it is right. Counting the cost is right. In fact, Jesus relates this in what seems to be kind of a general way in Luke chapter 14 when he says, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Counting the cost is right, it's good, it's a necessary part of life. We do it every time we go to the grocery store. We do it every time we, uh, we shop online or we get a quote from a repairman or uh, we plan a large project or when we look at the nutrition facts on the label of whatever we're about to stuff in our face. Or at least we should. But Jesus' message in Luke 14 and the Spirit's message in Acts chapter 21, it's about a, a whole lot more than all of those things. Uh, It's about something much more important than building a tower. It's not really Jesus' point. It's certainly not his point to us to tell us to to count our calories. If you look at the two preceding verses here, starting in verse 26, Jesus says this, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus and the Spirit are confronting the early disciples. They're confronting Paul. They're confronting the church today. We need to know the high cost of being a true Christian. Jesus is not saying here that we should despise our family. 
uh, that we should abandon them. But he is driving home the fact that our love and devotion for Jesus consumes all of life and it, it rises higher than all other loves, all other relationships, all other things that we have in life. So much so that we could even say that the comparison of our love for Jesus to our love for others is, is like a hatred for one and a love for another. Luke 16, 13 is helpful here when Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and fill in the blank. Our King, our Savior, our Master, our Sovereign Lord Jesus Christ deserves and commands our highest loyalty, our highest love, our, our highest devotion, and everything else is secondary. And it's a distant second at that. This is also what is meant when Jesus says, whoever does not bear his own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple." This phrase has kind of been turned into a, a pithy catchphrase uh, for any difficult thing that the Christian might face in life. Any nuisance uh, and any little difficulty to being a witness. My crazy kid, he, he pushes me to the limit of my, my daily walk with Jesus. And, you know, it's just the cross I have to bear. Or, you know, my, my co-workers... My godless co-workers, it's just everything I can do to hold my tongue in their presence, and it's just the cross I have to bear. You know, my, my stubborn uh, husband or, or wife, just, I just can't get through, and help me, Jesus, it's just the cross I have to bear. None of this is what Jesus means. Now, yes, Jesus calls us to make sacrifices, to endure in our witness through all kinds of different situations, certainly. But here, he literally means taking up a wooden cross and being crucified on it. Here, he, he literally means following him single file on the road to Calvary. He, he's talking about being willing to sacrifice your life for him and to do some to do so as someone that the world has cast off and, and reserved for execution. To gladly wear a beaten crown of thorns. To, to endure the pain of wood and nails. Counting the cost of being a Christian is right because it costs us everything. Being a Christian is everything. It is the best thing. This is what we are called on to believe when we put our faith in Jesus. It demands, I believe, that his life is not about, this life is not about me. I am not the center of existence. I am not even the center of my own life. And neither is anyone else I care about. God is. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is. His story, the story that began in Genesis 1 and ends in Revelation 20, 20, 22, that one is. At best, I am just a character in my own story. A story that's about God. Dr. Spiegel writes, and he says it this way, the triune God is the author, producer, director, actor, and the ultimate critic of the grand narrative of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. We're the extras, blessed to have a line or two and a spot in the credits. And what he has to tell me in this story is an awfully humbling reality that I am a sinner who has broken his law who has rebelled against his rule, who, who has made life about me and not him, and I stand condemned under his judgment. And the only way out for me is in nothing that I can do but in, in humbly kneeling before his cross and saying, Jesus, forgive me. I need your grace. I need you to save me. I've got nothing to give. 
And then it's to live always under his grace, by his good pleasure, according to his will, for his purposes, not mine. Now, if this strikes you as a little bit strange, it's because there's, this is not the only way that the gospel is presented. There is another way that the gospel is presented, and it's, it's been called uh, easy believism. What easy believism does in the gospel is easy believism says that the world revolves around you. You are the center of your story, and God is here to benefit you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. He, he is here to prosper you, and, and he's here to do nothing but bless you and to cater to your every whim, your, your every spiritual whim, anyway. All you have to do is believe he loves you, and, and, and you're good. You could add him to the array of other things that are all about you and your life, all the things that make you you, all the things that are here to cater to you and to make your life wonderful. God is one among many good things about you. The gospel and Christianity, in this way of thinking, are, are they're a good religious holiday, a, a good religious hobby. It's an occasional part of your life that it, it can make you a more well-rounded person by benefit, benefiting your spiritual health. Babylon B. wrote a satirical article that kind of touches on this idea, one that we all know very well in youth ministry. It says, a teen at summer camp rededicates life to Christ for next two weeks. It says this, local teenager Bradley Randolph rededicated his life to Christ at Green Pines Christian Camp last Friday afternoon, fully surrendering himself and giving his heart and mind over to Jesus for a full two weeks. Sources present at the camp's closing bonfire ceremony confirmed. After a week of watching funny skits, singing catchy contemporary Christian songs, and playing fun camp games, campers at Green Pines are encouraged to dedicate or rededicate their lives to Jesus for any period of time between one and five weeks, depending on their level of devotion to the Lord, according to camp officials. Bradley was quoted as saying, I now surrender my life to Jesus, committing fully to walk with him and look really super spiritual for the exact length of time it takes my emotional high to wear off. Randolph prayed sincerely, saying, It's now my desire to annoy all my family members with my newfound sense of smug self-righteousness for approximately 14 days, at which time I will return to my old ways of life without much fanfare. Now, this is silly, but this kind of idea of Christianity as a spiritual add-on for your benefit is not the message of Christianity. It's not the message of the gospel. And as evangelist and author Leonard Ravenhill says, if Jesus preached the same message many ministers preach today, he would never have been crucified. That's because this gospel has nothing to do with calling to repentance, nothing to do with humbling oneself before the God of all the earth, who is the center of all things and who demands our worship. And this is why counting the cost is right. It is absolute. It, it is fundamental. This is about what it means to claim the name of Jesus in the first place and follow him at all. Have you counted the cost? Is the gospel of Jesus Christ worth losing everything to you? Is the Jesus you believe in addition to your life or the source and center of your life? The reality check here is, is pretty simple. We all have to answer yes and no to this. Hopefully we at least answer yes, but we also recognize that our hearts are still marred with sin. Our hearts are still bent in on ourselves. And fundamental to our sin problem is our pride in making everything about me. This is a truth that I have to be reminded of constantly. Our default position, even when it comes to God, is to use him to suit our purposes. So the question and the reminder this morning, whether you've never believed this or whether you've believed it for years, 
is this. Do I believe that the Father God who sent his Son, the Son who died for me, and the Holy Spirit who directs me, is that God the center of my life? And what about my life today is not aligned with that belief? For some of you, you you need to call out to the Lord for the first time and to say, that's not the gospel I've been believing. Lord Jesus, I surrender myself to you. You are everything, and I cry out to you, save me, change me, make me your own. For others, this, this perhaps means that there is a relationship, there is a sinful habit, there is a, a closed-off part of your life that, that needs to be surrendered to the Lord. A person who needs to be told directly about the gospel. A sin that needs to come to light or that needs to be radically removed from your life, not played around with. A, a task or a hobby that's just, it just keeps getting in the way of other commitments you know you need to have to your, your church, to your witness. And it just, it needs to be put on the shelf or it needs to be scaled back at least. Counting the cost is normal and it's right for Christians. There is a way, however, that we can be reckless with this kind of a truth. There's a way we can, we can go perhaps a little too far with this and we do see it in the book of Acts. We, we learn also in this section that avoiding unnecessary risks or costs is wise. Avoiding unnecessary costs is wise. If we look again at the church and they're urging for Paul not to go, uh, apart from this being their normal response, it, it was also based on precedent. It was based on what had already been happening throughout the book of Acts. And I, I want to spend time to to really drive this home because this is not emphasized very much uh, typically. It's easy to emphasize the first point. If Paul chose to avoid an area of known imprisonment, of known persecution, it would certainly not have been the first time. Let's take a walk backwards through Acts. In Acts chapter 19, a, a, a riotous mob develops in Ephesus and they want blood. Paul wants to go into that crowd of thousands of people and not just the church, but even some secular people were telling him not to go, and they convinced him not to. In Acts 17, a riot was formed in Thessalonica, and instead of facing the mob, the church wisely sent Paul on to Berea. In Acts 16, after Paul and Silas are miraculously released from prison uh, with a Philippian jailer, uh, the city asks them to leave, and they do. In Acts chapter 14, Paul is stoned and he's left for dead at Lystra. And he leaves the next day. In Acts chapter 14, earlier on, Paul learned of a plot to stone him while he was in Iconium and he moved on to Lystra, which is where they eventually caught up with him. Now this is just Paul. Uh, one more thing we could look at is, is Peter, the apostle Peter in Acts chapter 12. After he was also miraculously released from prison by an angel uh, in Jerusalem, he left. He didn't stay around. He didn't go back in jail. He left. And this is not to mention, of course, Jesus, who on several occasions escaped imprisonment, escaped arrest, because the time was not right. He fled. Sometimes he fled out into the wilderness. So again, I take the, the time to point out these occasions because it's easy to think that doing anything other than rushing headlong into danger is a sign of weakness and a lack of faith. But all of these different passages will confirm that that's not the case. It's not the case. It's not wrong to avoid situations of persecution that are not necessary. It's true that we are often in need, we're really always in need of introducing conflict into our relationships, at least tension, to press on people the things that they don't want to talk about, sin and the Bible and salvation and grace and heaven and hell. These, these will always invite tension. We will always have to introduce that to, in some way. Uh, so we're always kind of running into trouble when we are sharing the gospel. However, our gospel proclamation is, is not our attempt to just start fights with everybody. 
uh, it's not an attempt to, to get into unnecessary conflict with people, particularly people who we know they just want to fight. Who we know, because we've shared several times already, that they're just going to yell at us. They might even, it might even come to a, a physical thing. When we talk with this person, it, it's just like talking to a wall, and, and it just seems like I'm wasting my time. While we need to take very seriously Jesus' charge to take up our cross and follow him to the cross, to Golgotha, we also need to hear his teaching in Matthew chapter 7 when he says, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. We all have situations with people who we've spent a lot of time on, and we've just reached a point where they just, they refuse to listen. They only react when we talk about anything along the lines of the Bible. And talking about these things is getting us nowhere. And we know that God can change anyone's heart, and we believe that. We pray that desperately. We, we know God can melt the heart of stone. We know God can do it in the final moments of someone's life. We know that God may have put us there to be ready when that time comes. But we also know that there comes a time when we need to move on. When you need to tell them that, that you've tried your best to share the gospel, your door is always open, you, they have your phone number, but this relationship just can't continue like this anymore. And when you're ready, that's the first thing we're going to talk about. It's the first question I'm going to ask. It may mean that you end that relationship. It may mean you just spend less time there or you, you stop your attempts to witness to them for a time and spend that time on others. But at the very least, these passages do give us biblical precedent, difficult as it is to recognize that the cost to your time, the cost to your ministry, the cost even of getting into potential fights is sometimes unnecessary. And it's time to move on. When we do this, we should also recognize that you are not their savior. Jesus is. And you are not the only person that Jesus will put in their life to bring them to himself. And he have, may have put you there for a time to do what you've already done and someone else will come in and they'll bear the fruit. But we need to have humility to surrender people to the Lord and to know that he will call his own, he will lose none of those that he calls, and we trust them into his care. When I was in high school, end of uh, junior year and kind of beginning of senior year is when I really started reading the Bible for the first time as a Christian. And for me, that began a, really a radical transformation. I was already a believer, but I really wasn't doing much more than trying not to cuss. That was my Christian life, basically. Going to church and not cussing, or at least trying not to cuss. It was hard. But as I read the Bible and the Lord really pressed upon my life, I, I, I just had a fire in my bones. I started preaching with my friends. My friends, my childhood friends, who, who I knew from the earliest time I could remember in grade school, um, they were the kind of friends who uh, would do drugs and get drunk on the weekends. And that would be the time I got to share. So being in the garage and they're smoking marijuana and, and drinking whatever they could afford to buy, and I'm preaching the gospel to them. And sometimes it seems like they're listening. Oh, yeah, man. Mm, yeah. And the next morning, they forget it all. And this goes on and on. I was there for them. I was there for them when one of my friends tragically hung himself in that garage was there for them after that happened. Was there for them for a long time. It came to a point where I recognized I can't keep spending time with you guys if this is all you're going to be doing. You know what I've told you. You know the gospel. But I can't keep saying I'm your friend like this. 
you know where I live, you know that I will stop everything on a moment's notice and talk to you. But when you're ready, this is what we're going to talk about. Repent, believe, be saved. So there I was, a senior in high school, and I had to make some new friends. I had to sit at a different lunch table. I had to give my my old friends to the Lord. Avoiding unnecessary costs is wise. But that brings us to a pretty obvious question. That is, how do I decide? How do I know, how do I make a decision between an unnecessary cost and a necessary one? And this question is not easily answered. But how does Paul do it? How does Paul make that decision? And why does he persist so strongly when everybody else is telling him, this is unnecessary, this is not something you need to do, Paul? Well, he tells us very simply in verse 13. Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be in prison, but to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul was ready and willing to take up his cross and die, and he was willing to do so because obeying God is worth whatever the cost. Obeying God is worth whatever the cost. Though there was really nothing wrong with the urging of the churches to avoid Jerusalem, and and we have past wisdom to demonstrate that that normally, all things being equal, is a good principle, Paul knew perhaps something these churches didn't know, and that was that he had a direct command from God to go and to go there. He told them this in Acts chapter 20, verse 22. He said, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit. Paul had a direct command. It was not up to him to decide anymore. And the consequences don't matter. The cost does not matter. As Paul also told the Ephesian elders in verse 24, I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The church wasn't really calling into question Paul's willingness to die, but This inevitable question is exactly the focus of this text and what needed to be pressed home. Note what the apostles did uh, before Paul even became one in Acts chapter 5. We see precedence for Paul's decision here. The high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles, put them in public prison, But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they had heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Yes, there are situations where the apostles did go to other places, but there's also situations like this. When they are freed that night and the very next morning, they go exactly back to the same place where they were arrested and preach the gospel again because they had a direct command from the Lord to do it, and the cost doesn't matter. The wisdom doesn't matter. The tactfulness doesn't matter. In Acts chapter 7, when Stephen is asked to defend himself before the same high priest that just arrested the apostles, he's told to give a simple answer about the gospel he believes in. He does so. He does so clearly and boldly, and he receives the honor of being the church's first martyr for it. And of course, Stephen and the apostles, they're just following the example of our Lord, our Lord who made the good confession before Pontius Pilate and bore witness to the truth. The same Lord who knew exactly what was to come and knew it much more than we know our trials And the apostles knew what theirs were going to be, and he bore his cross to Golgotha. He bore our cross. He suffered the greatest cost, one we could never pay. 
And not just at the hands of this world, but at the hands of the Heavenly Father who fully bore the wrath of God upon His Son that we might be saved. This is the model of our witness, of our commitment, of our obedience, and it's worth far more than, than any cost will ever endure. We will never know the cost that Jesus submitted to. But it's very easy for us to fall prey to, to cost analysis paralysis, to, to overly formulaic weighing of the costs to, to determine the best way forward, to, let's be honest, weaseling our way out of difficult situations, of surrendering clarity to the truth for, for safer, more careful conversations. The question in, in this text this morning is, am I erring on one side or the other? Am I erring on, on the side of obedience to God or of, of carefully weighed cost analysis? It's not always easy to know whether I'm, I'm sufficiently and properly counting the cost, whether I'm making the wisest decision in a situation, but it is easier to know whether I am being obedient, whether I am straining towards, trying towards, struggling towards, being having integrity with the commands of God in the scriptures. And wouldn't I rather accept questions about being a bit reckless than being a bit disobedient? Wouldn't I rather accept questions uh, about whether I can say the words of Paul or, or whether I, I have to answer for avoiding a difficult situation? Wouldn't I rather say Paul's words than try to get my way out of, work my way around why I didn't do that thing? And the simple truth is that most of us are much more prone to avoiding costly situations than we are to creating unnecessary ones. Bonnie Witherall was a missionary to Lebanon. She helped uh, poor and pregnant uh, Palestinian women prepare for childbirth at a clinic and also gave out Bibles and gospel tracts. Uh, the clinic was met with threats by extremist Muslims in the area, but she and her husband Gary, who also uh, served at a church there, they, they did not stop witnessing both at the clinic and at their church. On November 21st, 2002, uh, it was an early morning and Bonnie began preparing at the clinic for uh, a new day when she was met by uh, an extremist Muslim who mercilessly fired three shots at close range and murdered her. She was only 31 years old. Her husband, Gary Witherall, spoke at Moody Bible Institute just a few weeks after Bonnie died, and Laura, as a freshman, her first semester, was there to hear it. Gary also wrote in a book, he said, quote, we had counted the cost, and we knew the dangers. We felt that Jesus lived in the same way with few possessions, no home, and an itinerary that took him to places where people would possibly want to kill him. Bonnie was a martyr for Christ. The world would find her death uh, nothing but a tragedy, a waste of, of, of youth. But to Bonnie, for whom Jesus Christ was everything, she had the honor of dying for her Lord. She had the honor of being obedient no matter what the cost was. We named our daughter after Bonnie Witherall. And it just so happens that Bonnie, so far, is the most reckless of all my girls. <laughs> she is the one that will walk into a wall. No, run into a wall. She's the one who falls off of things. She's the one who just plain falls. 
She's the one who is also more daring and fearless, and even though her older sisters won't do it, she's the one who's willing to, to go on every ride at Disneyland, and her favorite ride, Splash Mountain. <laughs> and we want our daughter to be like Bonnie, to, to be accused of being a bit reckless, but we pray will hardly be accused of being obedient. Will hardly ever be accused of disobeying her Lord, of holding back, of not being able to say with Paul the same thing I need to say myself. I am ready. I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I consider my life, I count my life of no value nor as precious to myself if only I may finish my course and the, the ministry that I've received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of grace. Amen. Counting the cost is normal, and for Christians, it is necessary. It is right. We do have to recognize that situations in life sometimes mean we can avoid and should avoid unnecessary costs. But the thing we want to say the most loudly today is that obeying God is worth whatever the cost. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, you have led the way for us. And we confess that we are not as bold as you are. We are not as courageous. We, we are not as faithful. And we thank you before we do anything else that, that you have forgiven us for our faithlessness. You have forgiven us for the times we have, we have held back. You have died so that our sins, even our sins as Christians, could be forgiven. And we could rest assured that we have eternal life because of what you have done, dying in our place, bearing our punishment, setting us free. But, O oh Lord, we ask for boldness, we ask you would make us a bit more reckless. We ask, Lord, you would lead the way in our hearts by the Spirit so that we might say with Paul, our whole life is about testifying to the gospel of the grace that has saved us. Lord, would this be the forefront of our minds as we take communion together as well to know that this, this is what you have done. You have done this, Lord, to save us all. And anyone who comes in faith can be assured of their salvation and of their eternal life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It is our honor to serve you. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to continue worship and doing so in a special way by partaking of communion together. As we do so this morning, I'd, I'd like to take a moment just to read a passage of Scripture to prepare our hearts for partaking together. That passage is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 26 uh, through to 32. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. 
But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Often misunderstood passage, but the point here for us this morning is to say, am I partaking because I believe Jesus is everything and his salvation is everything to me? Would we do so proclaiming that loudly as we partake together this morning? The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Please stand as I dismiss us with the benediction. Before I do, please uh, be reminded that on every Communion Sunday, we also have a deacon uh, fund offering. If you would like to be able to give to that, the deacons will be at the doors on your way out, and that deacon fund goes to help people both within our church and outside of it uh, to share the love of Christ through the giving of our uh, means. Uh, so if you're able, please give towards that this morning. Um, I'd like to give a benediction from one of the doxologies in the Psalms this morning. This is the second one from Psalm 72, verses 18 and 19. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. In your church, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. Yeah.